and I am here. Sorry, guys. This needs to be reset. It's my magic little thing. That's how I control a lot of stuff that's happening here. So thank you all. Happy Sunday. Big show today. And a lot of stuff in here. In fact, there's two key numbers that will be mind-blowing that I will share today. And again, I love being here with you all on Sunday. This is the time where we take the top questions of the week, the top thoughts on people's minds. And where do the questions come from? Well, they come from Patreon. And uh, one of the casualties of the, I guess, the bear market we're in is we have spots open. And uh, so come on by if you want to give it a whirl. Uh, lots of good stuff. And we share a ton of good information on the inside. So thank you all for being there. Now, we're going to tar start with the first question of the day that came up from the community. And I do what the community says. So should I buy Quant? And this is an interesting one. Very familiar with Quant. Tracking it for a long time analyzing it for a long time but let me explain if we should buy it or not because i've been pestered almost to death everywhere and I, I must say as well when i get asked a lot like in comments on twitter and youtube about looking into one thing it's normally a kind of pump and dump scheme but this one is not that at all by no stretch let's talk about quant and uh, this question is from Treetop Vega. Ta da! Thank you for the great question. I would have answered it sooner, but nobody really cared. So, here, this is the quant returns during the bear market. Over the past month, it's up 62%, while the rest of the market's kind of flat. Uh, last three months, 75%. Last six months, 60%. And one year, still down 40%, but that's a hell of a lot better than most other cryptos. So what is quant and why are so people so excited by it? So first of all, quant is an ETH token and it's used to power the quants networks over ledger, they call it like overwatch type of thing. Uh, but quant is not a blockchain. It's an operating system that connects blockchain platforms with a one-step user interface. It's very, very important. And that's one of the reasons why. Anyway, we'll come to the conclusion at the end. Uh, but I do believe blockchain interoperability is essential. And Quant is targeting enterprise clients with the help of Oracle. That's Oracle Corporation, not Oracle like a chain link. Think enterprise software. And it is patented, which goes against crypto ethos. So there's a couple of things all there. I'm not going to do a full, like, should I buy Quant? Because it's a different situation. So first of all, for those who want to know how it actually works, I call it the hybridization of enterprise software and blockchain. And we're going to see a lot more of that as we go forward, especially as blockchains start piercing the enterprise. So a quick example of how this actually works. It orchestrates a HTLC, which I think is a hash time locked transaction interaction contract, HTLC hash time locked contract uh, between uh, the actual platform itself. And for example, OBC here on the right is the Oracle blockchain. Kind of funny, Oracle is an enterprise software company, and the Ethereum blockchain. So it's kind of hooking those two together. And the simple example to give is an airline traveler uh, for their demo. A smart contract is in escrow, and it's created on the Oracle blockchain by the traveler. And the tokens are transferred into it. The airline needs the escrow information, and that is now corresponding the escrow on the Ethereum blockchain. And the airline approves the tokens, of the more liquid asset to be moved into an Ethereum-based escrow and creates the corresponding escrow on Ethereum. And the traveler reads the escrow that has been created on Ethereum and checks it back and forth. Basically, the airline reads the secret that has been released by the traveler and sends the secret to Oracle blockchain to claim the corresponding tokens in the airline account. Real, uh, it wouldn't be the example I would use, but that's what they use anyway. And you can see how it's hooking in traditional enterprise software with uh, an Ethereum blockchain. And as we mentioned, of course, Quant is an ERC-20 token, which means it can be downloaded to any wallet. But let's talk about what they also do. They isolate layers. And this is their view of kind of future-proofing the platform across the different layers. You've got the application layer. You've got the filtering and ordering layer. You've got the messaging layer. You've got the transaction layer, the protocol layer. All of those layers were incorporated in that recent example I just showed with airline bookings as we go forward, which could also work for hotel bookings. So let's talk about who Quant go after. And their target market is fintech solutions to help 
banks, asset managers, financial institutions, fintech developers, and tech-related companies selling this technology where they need to integrate with other blockchains. Now, I always said the crypto compendium score out of the top 300 cryptos, it's number nine on our list. So it has an exceptional score of eight. You can see Bitcoin is 9.8, Ethereum is 9.4, and other top names are in there. But again, it is solid from a tokenomics perspective. But that does not necessarily mean you have to buy. It's just one of the factors you look at. Now, the conclusion, and this, uh, people always ask, why didn't you buy Quant or you missed Quant? Da, da, da. I do not invest in Quant because technically it's not a blockchain. And as you can see here, I only, my only focus, and again, just to zoom out for a second, when you are an investor, you have to have absolute focus and do a ton of homework. I can't analyze 19,000, 20,000 cryptos where 98% of them are garbage, but I will look at the ones that are that fit into my playbook and I'll identify the winner in that section. So here, my focus in crypto is only Bitcoin and pure play layer ones, maybe Matic as a layer two. That's it. That's as far as I go. And Quant is an enterprise software solution. They take fees for enterprise software licenses in Quant, which can be transferred from dollars straight to Quant immediately. And the demand for the solution seems to be going up because the demand for Quant is going up. And they are in bed with top enterprise software companies, which are beyond heavily centralized. Oracle, Amazon Web Services from Amazon, and it's also built using elements of Google technology as well. So that is me and Quant. I'm not saying it's not going to go to the moon. I'm saying it's not in my wheelhouse that I analyze to focus on, although we have looked at it many times. And I always say as well, after a big move like this, never chase, replace. And in fact, we all know that during bear markets, certain assets do do well, uh, but they tend not to do well in the bull market when the bull market arises. Think of assets like Chainlink, <laughs> another Oracle, not the Oracle we just mentioned. So that is kind of my take on Quant. And that's why I don't hold Quant, never bought it, never invested in it, because it's not a crypto per se, even though it's listed as a crypto token, ERC-20 token. So that's my take. Again, not advice to buy or sell or hold or whatever, just why I don't touch it. So next in the box is Shiba Godzilla. What do you think will get packed to its all-time high first? Bitcoin, ETH, or Solana? Ooh, this is a tough one. And this is one I think a lot about as we go forward. And again, all these uh, assets behave differently. They move differently. But let's look at a little bit of time series analysis. This is the top 10 cryptos, excluding stable coins, of course. Uh, but their time from all-time high and time from all-time low. You can see here a lot of young chains versus old chains. You can see names like um, XRP and Bitcoin. Their all-time lows go back over 3,000 days, which is nearly nine years. And if you look at Solana, Polkadot, and Near Protocol, they're all far younger. And the time from all-time high is also interesting. XRP is nearly 2,000 days or over 2,000 days. No, nearly 2,000 days as well uh, from its all-time high, which is a long time for those who can wait five years. I personally don't have that much time. I'm not that patient. But also remember, sometimes tokens will never get back to their all-time highs as well. And that's part of this question. Now, if you look as well at the average time from all-time high, when you exclude XRP, it's exactly 365 days. You can't make this up. And I was crunching the numbers. I said, oh my God, it's exactly a year on average since these names here, excluding XRP, hit their all-time high. That is crazy. And how long can we stay down here? Many think not much longer. So let's talk about, as actually Bitcoin is moving up as we speak. Uh, it's funny, a little pump there on the Sunday afternoon. Uh, let's look at another view of distances from all-time high. Again, I think this is a very interesting perspective. Obviously, the more riskier the solution, the more volatile the solution, etc. But if you look at the left axis here, this is the percentage from all-time high. It starts at zero, goes to minus 100. And the right is the percentage gainers back to all-time high, calculated as a return on investment. And you can see that uh, all, I put in a red line at the bottom, 
all near like near XRP, Cardano, Solana, Polkadot are all on average 88% from their all-time high today. And Solana and Polkadot are over 800% gainers to get back to their all-time highs. So that is kind of the question we must all ask ourselves is how much risk do we want to take on for how much gain and how much return? And that's why I look at times from all-time high, times from all-time low, give me the probability will they ever make it back to an all-time high. Some won't, of course. Some are ghost chains, some are scams, etc. But let's talk about this one. Now, in answer to your question, instead of going back to all-time high, I took the return halfway to all-time high. And I believe ETH could make it first because they are they have the least amount of inflation of all the tokens out there in this category. And they also have some big institutional movers thinking about coming in, especially with the Fidelity news last week and the week before. Uh, but note here for Bitcoin to go back, the return on investment to go back to halfway, which is $34,339, is 79%. And that doesn't sound very exciting to most <laughs> crypto investors. You know, 80% return, not bad. Most people want at least a double, triple, quintuple, etc. Ethereum is 85% to get back to halfway. And I do believe Ethereum will hit halfway first of these three. And that means Ethereum will hit 2400, which it was at, uh, I think, 160 days ago. So not that long ago. I think it can get back there pretty quickly, especially with a lot of institutional adoption and also with the fact that it's becoming, hopefully, as it gets more adopted, more deflationary. And the return to half for Solana is 362.5%, which is a big chunk. That goes from the price 28.07. I actually just hit 29 and spiked up uh, in the last hour. Um, but the half to all-time high is $129. So that's a big move. Now let's look at the second element. And again, this is what would happen if we got back to all-time highs. Bitcoin would generate 258% win. Solana, or sorry, Ethereum, 270% on the nose, 269.9%, and Solana would do 825%. And I believe, considering that Solana trades at less than 1 16th of the market cap of Ethereum, but it's as widely adopted and does a lot of transactions, I think it's a screaming value. And I do believe it'll at least go to 20% of ETH's market cap in the very near future. And as the market rebounds, I believe Bitcoin will rebound first, Ethereum second, and then once these things run, then money will transfer from the runners to the ones that haven't run yet, and that'll be Solana. And then that could go very high, and that would be 825% return. So basically, you're nearly making 3x the money investing in Solana than you are with Ethereum, but it's riskier. And that's where we are. Does it have a chance of going back to its all-time high of 260 plus dollars? Uh, the answer is, I believe so. If they continue to execute, if they get out of mainnet beta, if they have no more outages, etc., to solve all their problems, uh, the adoption should continue. But there is competition, and we do have new names sucking oxygen out of the room, like Aptos, etc., which I believe is part of the reason for the weakness in the Layer 1s last week. The so-called Sol Killer uh, <laughs> hurt all the Layer 1s. So, great question. Next question related to that from Ben M is Sol is now regularly under $30 and it seems to be making lower highs. Still buying or starting to worry? Um, not worried. I check the fundamentals almost every day. It's still being adopted. Wallets are still growing. Usage is there. Daily active users are growing. So from that perspective, no. But there are distractions out there in the marketplace. And the marketplace, as we'll talk soon, is driven by sentiment, not necessarily fundamentals up to a certain point. We'll touch on that in a later question. But this is one thing I do look at. This is the Sol ETH pair. And you can see here, it is down around 0 0.021. And this is typically the bottom out range for the Sol ETH pair. And I do believe these two kind of need to be looked at in unison together. Now, I am not buying any Solana yet. I, As I said before, filled my bags between 30 and $31 uh, during the summer and I have enough. Now I'm looking much more towards building out my equity positions as we go forward. But if we do see 0.02 again on this pair, 
I will swap more of my ETH into Solana because everything mean reverts. And right now, when you look at this chart, you can see here this Sol ETH pair at 0 0.021 is a good bit under the 50 day moving average of about 0 0.024 and a lot under the 200 day moving average. So that's the way I look at that. So I'm not concerned. We'll see. And uh, until I find a true Sol killer, which I believe Aptos is not, it'll take them two years to get the adoption that uh, Solana has. Uh, there's no need to be concerned. So, and I'm not seeing any concern yet with any of the metrics that I look at. Next question is from Mr. B. Satoshi. Seven months ago, I inherited $115,000 in an IRA. I thought it was cash. It is bonds and now at $65,000. Should I sell now and buy Bitcoin? A uh, tough one. So let's do a very quick recap on what happens with bonds. When interest rates rise, the bond prices fall. They are inversely correlated. And in addition, unfortunately, the 6040 portfolio has been the worst performing mixed bag portfolio in 100 years. So the timing, I'm afraid, for your inheritance could not have been worse. And I'm glad you realize the mistake of thinking, oh, bonds are a safe and they're like cash. Well, no, they're not. Um, now, that doesn't mean it can't go back to a time in life where they could be part of a portfolio. But right now, when I look at historical performance of bonds, they typically don't do well. So since 1926, the historical return for bonds is between 4 and 6%. And not financial advice, but yes, there are faster horses out there, as I like to say, um, much faster ones, as I just showed you a couple of examples before of where I believe <laughs> there could be much bigger gains than 4% and 6%. But of course, there's a lot more risk. So... Do with that as you will and uh, diversify. Don't have all your eggs in one basket, as I always say. Maybe take some of that, buy some, maybe some Tesla shares, some Bitcoin, maybe some good layer ones, etc. as you go forward. That's what I would not recommend because I don't give financial advice. So next one is Fish Lizard Man. If you were forced to balance the U.S. budget over the next few years, how would you do it? Cut military expense in half, remove Social Security, raise taxes 8 to 80%, destroy social programs. Uh, so this is, this is one of those kind of political ones where, unfortunately, sometimes things are just broken and there's nothing you can do. And I've been talking about that 77% tipping point of debt to GDP for a long time. Once you go beyond that, there's no coming back. And that is the hard fact. So could I balance it? No. It's it's mathematically impossible. So let's talk about what we have as a situation here. So one of the big problems, we do agree, we believe your ideas are all great, but they do have costs. Like, for example, slashing military budget when the world could be on the cusp of World War Three would be a very foolish move. Not at all. But I do believe the budget needs to be invested in a smarter way because the new types of wars are going to be monetary wars, semiconductor wars, you know, different type of flavor of exactly how they'll operate. Now, I will refrain, refrain from saying certain things, but there's definitely some things where that are real true problems right now today. So for example, Social Security is typically where those under 50 fund those collecting the benefits. And nothing wrong with collecting Social Security benefits, especially when you paid into it your whole life. I've paid into Social Security for a long time, more, you know, <laughs> decades and decades. Now, per Scott Galloway, uh, he said one and a half trillion transfer of wealth from millennials to, and Gen Z to boomers through Social Security. And they're probably never going to see any of that back because we'll talk about that in a while. Unless, of course, they continue money printing, which they will. And if people age 65 plus typically have 12x more wealth than millennials. I cover that in my Boomer and the Great Reset video. And the younger generation is paying everything forward. And this is why things like negative birth rates, big concerns for people like Elon Musk and others uh, is a massive issue. Because if you don't have a population growing, you don't have people to pay into the system to cover those who need the system. And that's the problem. But let's talk about unfunded liabilities for a second. This is the big number I want everybody to think about. 172 trillion, which includes things like Social Security and Medicare and a whole bunch more stuff. Again, completely 
unfunded. U.S. government already has 31.5 trillion in debt, and that's not going anywhere. <laughs> but they've got to keep increasing that debt uh, roof debt limit as they go forward. Now. Let's talk about a little bit of unfunded math. Can I solve this problem? And let me tell you what the problem is like. So the unfunded entitlement math is just to put in perspective how bad the U.S. situation is. And this is not unique to the U.S. This is the same in the U.K., same in Europe, same in Australia and all these other places. When you include unfunded liabilities, every household in America owes $1.3 million in federal debt. But... Half the households don't even pay taxes. So on average, you could say each household owes 2.6 million in federal debt. How can I possibly make each household come up with 2.6 million when far less than half of 1% of households actually have that type of money? So that is the problem. We're stuck. We're boxed in. And the other funny thing is you talk about things like cutting budgets. Well, I'll touch on that in a second, but... When you talk about a lot of people believe Social Security could go bankrupt, a lot of people believe it'll be drained empty by 2035, we'll see. The entitlement programs are definitely broken. Social Security will go broke in 2035. Last time I mentioned this, there was a lot of kickback and saying, no, it won't, it's fine forever. It's like, and no, <laughs> especially when you look at how they increase benefits by over 8%, not even keeping up with real inflation. And I understand why they have to do that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that accelerates the drainage down to about 2032, by my math. But we'll see. They can fund it, of course, because they can always print more money, increasing the deficit and increasing the debt. That's why it's kind of QE to infinity. Everything's going to be broken one day, and there'll be a huge reset. Now, talking very quickly about this one here, defense spending, as I did say, it would be a silly time to cut defense spending, U.S. defense spending, is about $0.8 trillion. The rest of the world spends less than that. And that's the key thing is, yes, the U.S. spends a lot, but I think they're investing in the wrong type of tools. They should invest in more of the tools that make more sense, like look what's happening in Ukraine. The importance of things like internet and drones and special types of rockets, I think that's where the money should go. But the real funny thing about this is the Fed right now is increasing interest rates to such a pace that the debt that they're going to have to pay on the interest they're going to have to pay on the debt will far exceed the defense budget, which is kind of crazy, which I think the 300 PhDs of the Fed are just quipping out their calculators and going, uh-oh, Houston, we got a problem. So radical proposals, what would I do if I was in charge? Well, you know, you could slash Social Security um, that would be a bad idea, but you could definitely take it away from people who have a net worth over a million dollars, and that would make a little dent in, in the program. And you could maybe let people opt out of it, like young people, if they don't want to have Social Security, but of course that would cripple the system because everybody would opt out of it. Uh, you could create a fair, fair and free market program and let you know the market try to deal with it itself. That will typically fail, just like socialized medicine typically fails in many places. Um, and I think they need to do proper math and be open and transparent and not kind of hide the ball and push the problem out to future generations. That's a big problem. But the truth is, as I say, QE to infinity, printing has to continue to support all of this. And going back to these numbers, when you look at these, you just get absolutely horrified <laughs> like the unfunded liabilities are ridiculously high so um sorry i don't have a magic bullet for that and uh, i'm sure if there was one somebody else would have thought of it first but there isn't uh, i'm afraid so again that's why i'm a big believer in the great reset down the line next question is from jdog um you guys are thinking about all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Defense budgets and war and Bitcoin. This is a Bitcoin question, which is kind of cool from JDog. What happens when a neighboring country who's on a fiat standard prints money to fund a war with your country, which has adopted a Bitcoin standard? And how does one respond? Is the only way to all start printing fiat like crazy? So this is uh, cool. It's one thing I thought a lot about in the past was, why doesn't a country just print a ton of money and buy all the Bitcoin? We'll see. Well, there's a price to pay for heavy printing as you devalue your currency, as we're seeing all over the world. Inflation, which is debasement, is eating 
everybody alive all over the world. But when you increase money supply by 40% in two years, that's going to happen. It's just um, pretty clear. Now, let's, before we talk about this, let's talk about the sustainability of a war and how it's a little bit different because we have an analog now we can actually look at. Now, if a country just prints a bunch of money, currency, fiat, to fund a war, again, the currency will become debased. So, for example, Zimbabwe, no matter how many dollars they print, they're not going to be going to war with anybody because their currency is worthless. Uh, many other countries I could list off that have the same problem. But ultimately, if a country cannot use its currency to purchase resources it needs for war, then it's going to be unable to sustain that war for very long. And we can look at these headlines here out of Russia. Again, they can print up all the rubles they want, but they can't buy the parts they need to maintain their tanks, jets, missiles, etc. And recently, we've been hearing more about Russia running out of semiconductor chips for its missiles, running out of artillery shells, and its jets are literally falling out of the sky due to its parts failure. Russia is actually getting drones from Iran to help them. Like who who would have thought, you know, a superpower, a so-called military superpower like Russia has to knock on Iran's door to help. Again, this is also part of this, this whole new war around uh, controlling the money supply, embargoes, etc. And controlling semiconductors is so critical for the future. And that's why we have the bigger problem, China, Taiwan down the line, but we're not going to go there now. It's beyond the scope of this conversation. So let's talk about Jason Lowry and uh, did a really cool video with him a while back. I will add a link here if anybody wants to see it. It is fascinating, but this reminded us of the conversation with Jason Lowry and he knows a thing or two about war and funding wars. And Jason made the point that historically all global currencies have been proof of work. He didn't mean proof of work in the sense of Bitcoin but proof of work in reserve assets to be backed by the expenditure of real energy. For example, throughout history, there was the gold standard. Uh, empires like the Romans, the British, etc., rose and fell on the back of gold. And that's why you hear things like, who has the gold rules? But gold is a classic proof of work system. And uh, then after the Nixon dollar situation we covered a while ago, that all fell apart. But then you had the oil <laughs> oil extraction and processing becoming energy to fund kind of making the dollar a global reserve asset and on and on and on. You can see here it is all related to energy and some type of proof of work. Now, Bitcoin, of course, is proof of work because you have to burn energy in the form of electricity to mine it and secure the network. Hence, in order for a currency to be as useful as the reserve asset, it has to be tied to energy and extracted with work. No matter what currency a country uses, that currency still has to be tied to something. And it has to be valuable enough to be traded for the resources that are required to wage war. That's the story. So I don't think it's possible for a country to print all at once to get access to what it wants. And we've discovered how the world is so interconnected after peak globalization. Now the warfare is about controlling the money and controlling the semiconductors. That's probably the future. Next question is from JGI. As long as we keep trading and treating Bitcoin with the same greed and fear mindset as we do in traditional trading markets, won't the volatility stifle Bitcoin become the ultimate store of value? This is a, an interesting question. But we have seen lately over Q3 2022 that the volatility of Bitcoin is actually lower than that of the Dow Jones, which is very... <laughs> normally pretty unvolatile. Let's talk about fear and greed of YouTube. And uh, again, PS, we did not make this graphic. It was found in the Google search. Um, and, you know, here you can see YouTube and Twitter sometimes can be a barometer of what people think out there in the marketplace. And the only thing that's driving Bitcoin's price is fear, greed, thumbnails, etc. But really, at the end of the day, I don't think it is. There's a lot of people trying to spread that fear. But I'm much more of the page that uh, Bitcoin price is a function of other elements. So let's focus on the real challenges here. It's not actually how market works, especially in the long run. Focusing on fear and greed neglects the real drivers of Bitcoin price. And the danger is it causes us to overlook more serious challenges to Bitcoin. Challenges such as how do we make Bitcoin easier and more practical for people to use, 
How do we reduce friction between the fiat system and the Bitcoin system and vice versa for remittances? How can we earn the trust of regular people? And this is why it's more important for us to focus on Bitcoin fundamentals and its organic growth and education. That's why I'm here. Then all of the fear and everything else. Bitcoin is there to serve people because of the problems you have in the system that have been in place since 2008 global financial crisis. Next, let's talk about fundamentals that actually matter. So here you can see, in our opinion, we believe security and vulnerabilities of the network measured by metrics such as like hash power, number of miners, minor profitability is very, very important. Size of the network measured by Metcalf's law, node count, etc. very important. Supply dynamics measured by stock to flow, huddle waves, critical. Organic adoption measured by number of users, number of applications built using Bitcoin, adoption of those applications, merchant acceptance, lightning network advances. Again, while these metrics don't predict the price swings driven by fear and greed, they are excellent in predicting the long-term price movement of Bitcoin, yet they're overlooked. Okay, People focus on other silly things. These are the ingredients that make up the actual price action. And remember as well, a bit of history here. A big thank you to WC for helping me with this one. Um, instead of paying attention to YouTube and Fintwit, etc., pay attention to this guy. His name is Benjamin Graham. He's the father of value investing, Warren Buffett's mentor. And he said, in the short term, the stock market is a voting machine. And in the long term, it's a weighing machine. The short term markets are focused basically as like a popularity contest driven by fear and greed, but long term fundamentals take over and the market becomes a weighing machine. Okay. This is exactly why I do all the heavy lifting work behind crypto to identify how the weighing machine will work over time. So a little secret there. So the next question is from CPK 2001. If the Fed is forced to pivot, it seems this will be another artificial manipulation of the market. Markets will go up, but artificially. Meanwhile, the underlying economy is being harmed. How does this manipulation relate to the macro outlook for Bitcoin and crypto in general? Brilliant question. Again, <laughs> the questions here are getting better and better. So let's talk about what we mean between short-term manipulation and long-term debasement. So short-term leads to long-term debasement. This is why we believe the Fed is doing what they're doing to the US dollar is actually bullish for Bitcoin. And the more the Fed manipulates the dollar and prints more dollars in order to prop up the markets and prevent deflation, the more the dollar becomes debased. Just look at what happened to the bond market. Again, we had bond questions in here today. It's incredible how all this is connecting together. But since the US owns the money printer, they can effectively devalue bonds, manipulating the interest rate and paying you back in deflated money. The microcosm we saw from our colleague who inherited $120,000 and it became half in six months. This is what's happening to the global pension scheme <laughs> on a magnified scale to the tune of billions. And that is the scary thing. So the consequences of this uh, manipulation and money printing is hyperinflation, which is a terrible thing for the average person. Now, the price of everything will inflate constantly, but imagine you're receiving your paycheck and have to rush to the store to spend it on anything you can because you don't have your, if you don't spend it now, your paycheck will be worthless in the next few days. Well, this is where we're going and this is where we are. Now, the biggest kiss of death for the Fed, of course, is deflation. But inflation is fine because ultimately they need to inflate their way out of debt or at least minimize the debt burden that the U.S. has. But I don't think they can even do that. They can do some damage. And we see that as well with like budget deficit numbers. And they're so proud of the budget deficit being down. But wait, wait till they see the new expenses coming in from the interest servicing. Now, the ace up the Fed sleeve is the central bank digital currency. And their solution is to hold out long enough, we believe, until they are able to replace the dollar system with a digital dollar system. And this will allow them to perform a monetary reset, effectively wiping out the old system and clearing their books of debt. With central bank digital currencies, the US government can re-denominate the dollar and force debt holders to take this new currency. 
And further, they will be able to redistribute wealth, control exactly who gets subsidies, who gets tax dollars directly out of people's accounts, etc. And this is what makes Bitcoin so valuable. Bitcoin is the opposite of a CBDC, and it cannot be confiscated, it cannot be debased. And in the short run, manipulation of the dollar will cause artificial pumps and dumps in the market. But in the long run, as Mr. Graham said, it will be a weighing machine. And that is the key message today. So <sighs> a lot of deep questions today. They're kind of exhausting. Next one is from Beans. I've been seeing the Arculus cold storage wallet advertised on YouTube. Do you have any knowledge about the security and ease of use of this from Beans? Well, all these wallet questions are popping up all the time. We did BC wallet last week and we had some comments about that. So let's check this one. What is Arculus? So first of all, it is a very intriguing project. It's a new type of wallet where your keys are digitally stored on a metal card. I know a lot of you bang your seed phrase into metal cards and split it into two and bury them in different places. But this metal card communicates with a phone app, a Arculus phone app, to send crypto, receive and send crypto. And this is definitely a very unique selling point that we have not seen before in the space. It's kind of fascinating, interesting. So how does it work? So the secret sauce is they use NFC. This is the stuff you use to tap your phone, your credit card uh, in a store. Uh, it's near field communication technology uh, to communicate between the app on your phone and the metal card. And this is the same technology everybody uses now today. And the metal card uses a secure element that digitally stores your keys. It's similar to the chips found in bank cards and credit cards, but they do use the BIP39 standard, which last week's wallet did not in terms of seed generation. So this is a positive, and uh, it's also like Trezor or Ledger. And if the device gets lost or stolen, you can restore all your crypto with your backup seed phrase, which is of that BIP39 standard, which is, you know, thumbs up. So let's talk about the little bit, final comment on this one. So Ar Arculus is owned by Compo Secure, which is a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ, and it specializes in manufacturing NFC chips in credit cards. And they got 20 years of experience in the credit card payment space, and they are definitely the right company to build such a solution. However, a couple of little things just to be aware of. One, no open source code. Therefore, we don't like wallets that aren't open source projects. They do have a white paper, but we'd like to see more documentation, which is uh, simply not to the level that we want. We want to see more around specifications, etc. how it's actually built. Uh, there's very limited coin support as well. They support, support Bitcoin and Ethereum, but not much else. Nothing for Cardano, Solana, BNB, etc. And they don't even support all of Ethereum's derivatives, ERC-20 derivatives. It's also unclear how many different cryptos you can have on one card. They mentioned that the chip only has 512 kilobytes of memory, which is very small in this day and age. 20 years ago, that was a lot. Today, it's nothing. And in their frequently asked questions, uh, they mentioned you can only create one wallet. If this is the case, then it's very limiting. As I, we always say, never keep all your eggs in one basket. And if I'm understanding that correctly, basically you're forced to reuse addresses which is a big privacy concern. And there's also no mention of a wipe pin or duress pin, which is something we would like to see. So another wallet review. <laughs> so I hope that helps. But the conclusion for you all to take away is we'd love to give it a shot, but we would not use it for cold storage. And, uh, you know, it's, it's probably uh, going back to the example we mentioned, it's something that you can use to make transactions and carry in your pocket, but it's not designed to be a true cold storage device that you would bury in your backyard. I would not use it as my primary cold storage device to store life savings, but it's an excellent hot wallet replacement. You use it to securely store and spend your crypto or your money. Now, but just imagine yourself running around with in town with a Trezor in your pocket it's impractical and not safe. And running around with this articulous card in your wallet makes much more sense. Put it in your wallet with your other credit cards, and then you know where you are. But again, not for heavy-duty storage of crypto as we go forward. Just what we believe. Next question is a fun question from Sinsec. 
would you ever consider moving to another country? And if yes, which one? Well, as I always say, I believe the future will be kind of gig jobs, small short-term jobs, one week, three months, whatever, and move around for those jobs and maybe take some time off and live in the favorite places in the world. So I envision a world where people will live two or three or four different places year to year. We already have that model in places like a lot of Canadians, Snowbird, they moved down to Arizona uh, during wintertime in Canada just to get out of the cold. But one place I would love to live, and it's one of my favorite places on earth, and I've been there many, many times, is Lake Como in the Lombardy region of Italy. I actually took this picture a couple of years ago on a boat. A little rinky-dink little rental that I took out in the lake. I took a picture of a dream house, and this is it. Dream place, dream house. I also love the uh, Varadero, not too far from there, and other great places. But I also like other parts of the world, too. But I think this would be a good base to set up shop. Uh, of course, if the tax and crypto jurisdiction is friendly to make that happen. So with that, favorite part of the week is helping animals. And big thank you to your Super Chats and stickers. We... Uh, supported, sponsored three new owls. We have Gus. He fell from a tree and rescuers tried to keep her as a pet. And due to the impression left on our rescuers, she has been able to return to the wild. We have Papa Jiho, uh, probably was hit by a car, is now a surrogate, a parent to orphaned owls, owlets, little baby ones. And Athena, the goddess of wisdom, partially blind from West Nile virus, probably, and she isn't able to return to the wild too. So huge thank you, everybody. Hope you learned a lot today. I'm going to answer some quick questions from everybody now out there in the Cryptoverse. And uh, again, appreciate you all. And thank you all for being here on a Sunday. Let me just pull this up. And thank you to the team that's supporting me too. And the moderators in the chat. Rock Dogs, first question. Thank you for your commitment to the community and the team you've enlisted to support your vibe research. Yes especially our wallet experts uh, are a pretty amazing uh, team out there. So big thank you to the team as well. And thank you, Rock Dogs. James McLaughlin, I'd love to know your thoughts on World Mobile. And are they going to disrupt the telecom market? CTO Larson spoke to the WMT team recently. I did look at their token. I looked at the tokenomics and I didn't like it. Uh, I have been monitoring kind of IoT, Web3, disruption of telco, but we are very far from that level yet. Uh, I don't, I looked at it, uh, it must be a couple of times in 2021 and then early 2022, have not looked at it since, but I would not touch it. Um, not my cup of tea, as they say. And also I look at things like Helium as an analog. It is positive that Helium is moving to um, the Solana system, but Helium itself as a solution has a lot of problems going forward. So, uh, James, I will take another quick look and see if anything comes out. But at the time, I did not like the way it was structured, didn't like the tokenomics, etc. Mr. Chili's, in a decentralized and uncensored utopia, how can a villain on the loose be punished? If crypto takes over TradFi, how do we deal with hackers or other financial crimes? Well, this is an interesting one because I have recently been challenged again. And we're going to talk about kind of, I always talk about the pros of blockchain, but this video is about the cons of blockchain and why it's bad. And uh, I will touch on that. But basically, one of the good things about blockchain is Again, it is not anonymous. You can still track things. And there are tons of companies being funded right now that their specialty is to track cyber villains, crypto villains, etc. And therefore, uh, it will not, <laughs> in this decentralized, uh, uncensored utopia may never exist with blockchain. But blockchain will still be a lot better than the traditional world in which we operate. And remember, I think it's less than 1% of all crypto is used for crime and something like 20, 30% of fiat is used and money laundering and crime and stuff. So again, it's the blockchain world is still better, but people can still be caught even in that world, Mr. Chili's. JKS, what is your snipe price on Tesla and how soon do you feel it could get there? So I uh, got into a 
<laughs> a good I, I bought more tesla in the last uh, i think two weeks since i have since 2019 or even 2018 i don't even remember um but that was around 203 204 205 very low 200s i do believe if elon musk does have to sell another three billion or so to uh make up to pay for some of the people that left the financing deal for twitter if that does happen uh, that could bring a price maybe down to a maximum floor of 180. But I'm willing to take the risk that 203, 204 was the floor. Um, if I missed it by 20 bucks, that's okay. That's not a big deal. Um, but long term, I still remain extremely bullish on the company. Uh, right now, I think Tesla, if I remember, is trading about 214. So anything under 220 is uh, a screaming buy. Remember, it was over 400 bucks <laughs> not too long ago. So it's half price. And uh, many analysts believe it'll double very quickly. A couple more quarters of earnings. In fact, Q4 could just completely blow it out of the water. When we see the revenue and the margins and the roadmap, uh, 2023 is going to be a mind-blowing year for Tesla. No doubt in my mind. Um, Terra and Crypto, your 2021 end of year video showed Cosmos being the one coin you missed. With 2022 coming to a close, have you changed your mind on Cosmos? No, I haven't. And I reassess all those assets. Uh, Cosmos was always one of those ones that I believe is fantastic from its kind of SDK point of view, but they were never really able to monetize it. Now, when I look at things like inflation and all the other factors and tokenomics and SCP profiler, it still is not up there. I still rank Matic above uh, Cosmos. And Matic is the third best of ETH, Sol, Matic, and then the rest come down the line. So have not, um, you know, th this is kind of important to notice as well. And it kind of relates to what we discussed during the video today. Over time, <laughs> the markets are a weighing machine. But in the short run, they don't know what they're doing. And that's very clear as well. You have a company like Tesla going from 400 to 200. <laughs> and the company's only gotten better and stronger. So that shows you how stupid the markets actually operate and how inefficient they are. And that's why we're here to help you identify market pricing inefficiencies, because that's where the money is made. So even though I don't own a crypto or an asset, doesn't mean it won't go to the moon. But over time, I believe we've done the homework to identify the winners over time with the least amount of risk. Very important to say. Um, AG, is Evergrande now resolved? No, it's not. <laughs> the Chinese property market is a disaster. The the property developers are smashed, uh, more shoes to drop. But the Chinese market is very, very closed and controlled. But I think property values in China have fallen like 60% in the last year or so. And Evergrande is far from resolved. And what they are doing over there is just craziness. So, uh, no. But the beauty of the Chinese market being closed means whatever happens over there, it doesn't really impact the rest of the world. So the whole property market in China can implode. The rest of the world would just tick along. But the rest of the world also has a lot of issues too. Mr. Bombiggy, thank you so much. Uh, KPM is very addictive. Love you too. Greetings from Morocco. Back soon. Safe travels, my friend. And thank you so much. And Java, you rock too. Um, <laughs> miss you too. And you guys are amazing. Really touching. MT, thank you too. And Kiwi Robin, this is why we can... Do so much. I really appreciate everybody. It's very, very touching. Kado, I'm a proud Patreon member. Uh, I suggest everyone to join. What's your rough and ready opinion of Filecoin? Filecoin is a utility. I tend not to invest in utility things, whether they are things like oracles or storage. And that, that's why I don't touch Filecoin. It does have good tokenomics, by the way. So it is not the worst. But again, the key to investing is have extreme focus as soon as you start dabbling in many, many different things, uh, you start to lose. So for me, I focus very much on Bitcoin and the top layer ones. I focus very much on things like Tesla and disruptive technology stocks. And that's it. And I work uh, around the clock, seven days a week. So if somebody thinks they can literally look at more things, um, <laughs> fair part of them, but there's no way they can go deep. And the other thing as well, what's really, really important, in fact, after DCA on Thursday, 
um, Rob and Ben and I had this little conversation. I thought it would be good maybe on Rob's channel next week to talk about how we have different styles because I am a trader and people think I'm a buy and holder. No, I trade scalp this everything so if i buy something you know odds are i'm trading something against it or swapping something or hedging against it with something else over time so that's a very very important point as well to note but filecoin i'll have another look we're kind of waiting to come out of this holding pattern of the crypto bear market to identify what the new winners will be as we go forward has anything changed in our theses as we go forward. We're gonna revisit all the SCP profilers, all the compendiums, look at the markets, look at changing technologies. Maybe there will be a play for, who knows, a chain link or a file coin or another one down the line. And a big thank you as well for your super stickers, F.A., J.W. Gula, P. Robin, P. Dot, Artem, Mr. Hammer. Appreciate your service, sir. Green Candle, Bottle Red, and Emily Gray. Love you all. Happy Sunday, take care of your family, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye.